Okay, people are joining. So perhaps we should uh, start. So I will uh, welcome you all to the Science Society talk today. Today we have the pleasure of welcoming uh, Dr. William Gibson. Uh, Dr. Gibson, born American, uh, is a permanent resident of Singapore at the moment. Uh, Dr. Gibson uh, holds a PhD in literature from the University of Leeds in the UK. Uh, he has contributed to many uh, articles, books, translations, scholarly translations, and so on. And he also uh, fictions, novels. Uh, Dr. Gibson currently is uh, an associate lecturer at the Singapore Institute of Management. But besides teaching, uh, he is also writing. And he has been writing for uh, about two decades, books and articles, including <clears throat> in uh, prestigious uh, peer reviewed journals. <clears throat> and his most recent published uh, research focuses on Southeast Asia, and especially on the colonial representations of the exotic in Asia, and uh, with a focus especially in the life and work of the French journalist and photographer named Alfred Raquez, who is the topic of the talk today. His extensive work and translations and research on the biography of Alfred Raquez was published as a monograph recently, 2021, as part of the Rutledge Studies in the Modern History of Asia series. And also very recently, uh, Dr. Gibson was named a Li Kongqian Research Fellow at the National Library of Singapore in which he is working, uh, building an archive of Kelamat, a sacred shrine, Muslim uh, graves, if you will, in Singapore and in the region. But uh, today's talk, back to Alfred Raquez, the talk of today is to explore the visit in 1903 of French journalist and explorer Alfred Raquez who visited Bangkok to cover the uh, jubilee or the 50th anniversary, uh, golden jubilee of King Chulalongkorn, or Rama V, for the uh, French newspaper based in Hanoi, French newspaper named L'Avenir du Tonkin. And so we learn more about it as I'm giving the floor to uh, William Gibson. The floor is yours, William. And before, okay. and before we start with William, I'm sorry, I should, uh, for the attendees uh, here, while you're listening, the talk will, will last about 40 to 45 minutes, I believe. And you may uh, leave some questions and comments in a Q&A box that you should find below the screen, okay? And by the end of the talk, we'll get back to those questions and get some answer from William Gibson. Okay, so William, the floor is yours, thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's see if I can get this done correctly. Can you see my uh, slides appearing there? No, I can. Yes. That's good. Okay, that is good. All right, well, thank you, Nicholas. Uh, sure. you, can't, you can't see me, but um, you'll, see, you'll see me at the end. And okay. thank you also to the uh, Siam Society for inviting me to give this talk today on, uh, as we've just said, the uh, 1903 Jubilee of King Chulalongorn through the eyes of Alfred Requez. Fantastic. You should see the cover of my recent publication, uh, a biography of Alfred Requez. The book, yes. Uh, yeah, there it is. That's Rutledge in two, uh, 2021. Uh, it was published uh, just a few months ago. And the material that I'm presenting to you today uh, also appears in this book, uh, which you can get either online or at the finer bookstores in your neighborhood. Now, who is this man and, and why, are we, why are we talking about him? Uh, we, we need to first begin with just how we pronounce his name. Um, he explains by way of a pun in his, his first book that his name rhymes with the word, the French word, le casse, uh, which means cash box. This itself is a joke, which we're going to get back to towards the end of the, uh, end of the lecture. Uh, but we would then pronounce his name something like Requesse, 
with a soft uh, S sibilant S on the end, as opposed to the hard kind of uh, buzzing Z sound like Lopez. Um, so we'll we'll try to stick with the correct pronunciation throughout uh, Rikess. And there's a photograph of him, one of the very few that exist, taken in Hanoi in uh, 1902. Now, speaking about pronunciation, uh, as you will very soon find out, my French pronunciation is not great. Uh, I do tend to speak with a California accent, but Nicholas has very kindly, on behalf of French people everywhere, uh, agreed to forgive me for my, my, my bad French pronunciation. And I really need to thank Nicholas for taking on that awesome task. Um, unfortunately, my, my tie is worse than, than my French, and I, I have to ask forgiveness to the, the world at large. Uh, I will try. And, and get the pronunciation correct for the few Thai words that, that I will say. Uh, and with all that, let's continue and find out who is this man, Alfred Rakes. Well, he certainly had his name printed a lot. So he first appeared in Indochina in 1898. He was a man in his 30s who had claimed that he left France because of overwhelming family sorrows. Uh, he would travel through Indochina and then into China itself before returning to Hanoi from where he would launch a highly successful career as a journalist, and it was to be short-lived. He died suddenly in 1907, effectively bookending his career in parallel with the Fond du Seclou era. Now, despite the brevity of his career, he managed to produce an absolute mountain of work. So between 1899 and 1906, he wrote three books, published hundreds of articles in numerous periodicals, snapped thousands of photographs, published 200 postcards and helped to mount two colonial expositions, one in Hanoi in 1902 and the other in Marseille in 1906. And if you, if you delve into the um, newspapers of this period, uh, both in France and in, and in uh, Indochina uh, and look for his name, it, it really just pops up all over the place. So for about 10 years, and we can, we can see that rising, he, he kind of builds up a celebrity for himself. He also traveled incessantly. So while producing this amount of work, uh, here's a full list of all the major cities that he went to between this, this sort of short period of time. Uh, fairly incredible. Bangkok, Batavia, Hanoi, Hong Kong, Wang Prabang, Macau, Phnom Penh, Shanghai, Singapore, Vientiane, Yokohama, and the list even goes on. Uh, keep in mind, this was during the steam era. There were no airplanes. Um, automobiles were only, only, only on the cusp of becoming a kind of mass-produced thing. I mean, this, this was really undertaken uh, under, under steam and under uh, um, and, you know, animal power that he was able to travel all this. And it'd be exhausting to do this much today. So the fact that he was able to do this at the time, I think, and produce this amount of work is, is impressive. He was also quite urbane. Uh, and uh, he was a bit of a boulevardier, and he enjoyed gallivanting in the red light districts of Shanghai. He, he left us some descriptions of this. And then when he moved to Hanoi, he operated his own popular cabaret there. So he was, he was a bit of a bon voyant as well. Uh, however, even on top of that, a man of parts, uh, he also, when not in these metropolitan areas and, and being this urbane man, he traveled very wide and far into the frontiers uh, of the region. Uh, way up into Mio country in Guizhou in uh, southwest China. He spent months traveling into Laos, uh, more, more than a year actually, on two separate ex expeditions. And he went to parts of Laos that very few Europeans uh, have ever seen or, or really ever would. And modern historians have identified these regions as part of the Zomia of upland Southeast Asia. Uh, James C. Scott, I think, has probably got the book, um, to, the, 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 wrote the book on this called The Art of Not Being Governed. This slide is a, is a, uh, a brief of what he was, uh, his book is about. Uh, but this is essentially considered to be a peripheral zone, an upland zone populated by people who have lived for millennia, at least have lived beyond official state power, uh, and portions of which, of course, remain a, a quasi autonomous to this day. And I've put some red circles around uh, the slide to show where Riquez spent most of his time, uh, which was in where the French had their sphere of power. They um, didn't. Uh, uh, he didn't travel very far into like British, British Burma and, 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 and Lower Thailand. He only, he only went where, when he was in the frontier, was where the French had some kind of power. Uh, he described himself as an explorer without a mission. Explorer without a mission, which I think is a pretty good self-descriptor. Uh, that's, that's something he can, he can hang on to. Despite this wanderlust, uh, he managed to charm his way into the highest circles of uh, Belle Epoque Indochina, from Governor Generals Paul Dumer and Paul Bo 
to the emperors and kings of Anam, Cambodia, Laos, and Siam. He meant all of them. Uh, and he would eventually even meet the president of the French Republic, uh, as well as uh, the famous uh, sculptor uh, Auguste Rodin. And by the time of his death, he had attained a kind of level of celebrity in France, I think would be the envy of most modern journalists. And he did all of that in, in less than 10 years, uh, an incredible amount of work uh, and a criminal amount of, of manipulation of a system of fame, which is what we're about to discuss, that existed that would allow someone with these talents to, to rise and become famous. Here's a photograph of him from 1902 in Hanoi uh, with assorted grandees and members of the colonial press. Uh, there are not many photographs of him, it's a shame, uh, but there, there, there he is with, with at least some, some uh, uh, members of the elite. Now, th his fame came in large part uh, to, uh, from efforts that we would recognize today as French colonial propaganda. Um, his earliest publications tended more towards travel books, uh, and his very first book was a uh, published book, was, uh, was Journeys Through China, published in uh, 1900. Um, and you can see uh, one half of the screen, the original uh, book cover there, Ope da Pugod, uh, in the land of uh, pagodas. Uh, the uh, colorful book cover is um, the translation that I did with my good friend Paul Bruthia. Uh, this published by the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies Press, and that's available as well of this uh, very long and very detailed uh, travel through uh, Southwest China, which is not a part of China that a lot of visitors went to at the time. It was very much part of the frontier, as we said, part of Zomia. So his record of that, of that travel is, is uh, uh, both unique and I think uh, of, of, of value. And his next publication, his book length publication, was of yet another travel uh, through Lao. Uh, this was um, in 1901, published in 1902, Page Lao Tien, Laoian Pages. And again, you can see the original uh, book cover, as well as the translation uh, that Paul and I did for this book. Again, a critical translation with introductions and footnotes, uh, and also part of uh, Southeast Asia that at the time was considered to be remarkably remote still considered fairly remote. And uh, I think a, well worth uh, a read for anyone who's interested in Lao or French Indochina, so you can pick that up. Now, I have uh, highlighted on this uh, page, the publisher of this book, F.H. Schneider, F.H. Schneider, who would become um, a kind of vehicle for uh, Riquez's rising fame. Uh, who is this man? There he is. This is some that same photograph from 1902. Uh, he was seated on this, in the front row with, with uh, Riquez. Um, and in around 1901, uh, Riquez had settled in uh, Hanoi, where he began to write for the daily newspaper L'Avenir du Tonkin, uh, which was kind of the paper of record for French Indochina. Uh, it was uh, like writing for the New York Times or the London Times or something like this. And this was the beginning of his career as a journalist closely allied with uh, this publishing mogul, Francois-Henri Schneider. And uh, Schneider was a very powerful figure in Tonkin. Uh, he was born in Paris and he arrived in 1882 to work in the colonial printing office in Saigon. Uh, a year later, he relocated to Hanoi and set up a professional printing operation. What he had, his, his vision was that he realized he could make very high quality paper very cheaply from bamboo, a kind of uh, or forerunner of, uh, of uh, you know, sustainable, paper printing. So he used bamboo to create paper cheaply. And uh, with this insight, he and his brother Ernest created a publishing empire that held a virtual monopoly on the paper and printing in Indochina for, for many decades. And as part of that, he also ran this newspaper empire uh, in which Riquez managed to make his name. And if you look at the photograph, uh, this is a postcard. Uh, and you can see uh, his name on the signboard on the building is kind of on a slant, but you can just, just make out his name on the second signboard down, F.H. Uh, Schneider. And then between two trees, you can just see the, the, uh, the first half of L'Avenir du Tonkin, the, the, the name of the uh, newspaper. Uh, the, the Tonkin is, is blocked by the tree, but you can see L'Avenir uh, there. Um, so this is the man who, who had this um, uh, newspaper empire. Now, it, it didn't uh, function by itself. He, he was part of what was known, and both of the brothers were active in this, something called the Party Colonial, which was a loose affiliation of politicians, businessmen, and journalists uh, who wished to see France's colonies expand via commercial as opposed to a strictly military means. And they believed the way to achieve this goal was through something called mise en valeur, 
which was a softer stage of colonization that followed the initial kind of tough conquest. And in this stage, this later stage, the idea was mise en valeur would bind colonizer and the colonized together in mutually strengthening trade, everyone working for the benefit of the motherland. Uh, it was a potent, but I think ultimately shallow vision, and it needed constant propping up. And to that end, the Party Colonial formed a propaganda machine known as the uh, Sundica de la Presse Colonial that ran periodicals in France, such as La Depeche Colonial, which also had an illustrated supplement and, uh, and several other newspapers. Uh, and in addition to original content that was produced in France, these papers would frequently reprint articles from newspapers in the uh, colonies who um, were uh, uh, part of this syndicate. Um, so here's a, an example of that process. So it, for example, uh, Riquez wrote an article that praises uh, Empress Dowager Circe's modernizing edict forbidding the brutal practice of binding girls' feet uh, in, in China. And unfortunately the edict was widely ignored and soon rescinded. Uh, but it, his article on, on this, first appeared in L'Avenir du Tonkin uh, in, in February, 1902, 12 February. Five days later, the same exact article was printed in its sister publication, the weekly magazine uh, Revue Indochinois, and then in Paris in La Depeche Colonial on 29 March. And you can see the exact same text being repeated in each of these publications. And this kind of recycling of content serves several purposes, uh, much like it does today, uh, not least saving money, um, you didn't have to generate all new content, you could take someone else's, but it also created in, in a kind of modern parlance, a, a media echo chamber in which ideological positions would be reinforced by repetition. Uh, so for Riquez, it also presented a means of promoting himself across multiple platforms, both in Indochina and the metropole. And this is how his fame grew. Uh, and when it came to French interests in uh, Siam, this well-oiled machine of French colonial propaganda played an important role in forming popular opinion. So as, as a kind of a part of this mechanism, not only was Riquez building his own fame, but he also eventually, of course, began writing about Siam. And there's an old map of Siam, so you can see it there. Uh, and of course, the long border that it, had, it um, had with French Indochina, with Laos and Cambodia. Uh, and there are members, and this is this is something that uh, I, this, there's uh, been a lot written about this and the, a lot of different positions. Uh, from, from what I've read in these old newspapers, it, it, it goes something like this. Many in the French administration in Indochina wanted to essentially occupy land uh, in Siam. Uh, they were especially interested in the Korat Plateau uh, along the north, which is incredibly fertile. But there were some elements within, within the French administration, military elements, especially quite gung-ho, who were ready to, uh, to occupy much larger swaths of the country. And during Riquez's time, there was an argument that arose to kind of justify such an incursion. Uh, and in a nutshell, the French argued that the ancestors of native peoples who were now under their protection in Indochina, uh, and remember, they, it was Lao, for example, as a protectorate. They didn't, it wasn't called a colony, but a protectorate. So uh, these people, had, some of them had been previously resettled in Siam by Siamese forces in earlier conflicts. There were Laotians and Cambodians, as well as some tribal peoples. And uh, this offered an excuse for a French incursion, basically saying that you know, these people, uh, because they're Laotians and we protect Laotians, we should be able to protect them no matter where they are. And the only way to do that would, of course, be to march into Siam and set up garrisons, uh, especially in the border towns uh, in, the, in the provinces that, that were along the border. Um, and this argument rose in parallel to an argument being put forward by King Chulalongorn uh, that uh, as part of an effort to create a modern nation state that claimed his people were all Siamese, uh, and thus Bangkok had historical claim to all Siamese territory. And this is where modern Thailand comes from. Uh, so that on both sides, it was, there was an argument for uh, a kind of identity of, of this land um, and uh, who could make claims to it. Um, and keep in mind that, that Chulalongkorn was sovereign. And he, there, weren't, there was no, he, we didn't have to answer to, to any colonizing force and Siam was independent. So to promote this French position, this kind of loopy argument that they had, Riquez was commissioned in 1903, which is the same year he would visit Bangkok for the king's 50th birthday jubilee. He was commissioned to write an essay 
for the uh, Bulletin du Comité des Asies Francaises, um, which uh, uh, was a committee that had been formed several years earlier by some prominent people, Eugene Antillon, one of the leaders of the, of the party colonial. Uh, its members included familiar names from the elite of French Indochina, including Governor General Bo, uh, F. H. Schneider, as well as intellectuals like Louis Fanot, who was one of the founders of the Ecole Francaise d'Extreme Orient, the French uh, School of the Far East, and the highly respected sonologist Henri Cordier. And despite the weight of this committee's mantle, I mean, these are, these are you know, big, big shots, uh, the chief aim of this bulletin, which was published every year, was to print articles that justified French expansion in the Far East. Uh, it was yet another form of, of party colonial propaganda, albeit with a kind of scholarly veneer. I mean, it was packaged as this kind of uh, uh, more of an academic tone. It meant to elevate it above newspaper articles, um, but it, it, it served the same purposes. So you can see the cover of the 1903 uh, bulletin uh, on one side of the screen. Sorry, it's a bit blurry. That's what I found online. And on the other side is uh, Riquez's article where he puts forward this um, uh, argument uh, that the French should should be should be uh, allowed into into Siam because of uh, of the the ethnic makeup. Uh, the title of that thing is something like a comment on the people of Siam and the, their population today. Uh, so to this end, this article argued that uh, King Chulalongkorn's uh, territorial claims were dubious because Siam really was an agglomeration of different ethnicities. And I understand that's still a sensitive subject in Thailand, and it's not one I'm going to go any further into. Thank you very much. Uh, and so what he was really trying to do, Riquez was trying to identify people who would uh, be deserving of uh, French protection within Siam. And uh, on that point, he didn't, he didn't uh, pull his punches. Uh, he begins the first paragraph of the essay says clearly distinct groups of natives from the surrounding regions, as well as ultra mixed blood Siamese who adorn even the most intimate apartments of the Imperial Palace, such as the population over which His Majesty Chula Longorn today extends his flawless ivory scepter. And there's this, this Parisian um, sarcasm uh, insouciance that comes through uh, in, in a lot of Riquez's writing, especially his polemical writing. Uh, and then the, this long article, it goes through the different ethnicities he identifies and actually is, is, is a fairly uh, interesting um, uh, scholarly exercise in identifying the different ethnicities, but it's, it's, it's bookended by this really almost incendiary rhetoric. Uh, he concludes, the ethnography of Siam resembles that of Austria. All these disparate elements that a semblance of administrative unity now brings together will fall apart at the first wind. The Siamese provinces are like fruit ready to fall from the tree if you shake it a little. And that's I mean, it's incredible that this, you can imagine if this was said today in the United Nations or something. I mean, this is, this is practically a declaration of war. Uh, I mean, incendiary kind of language. Uh, this was the French position, uh, the position of the Parti Colonial, the position of the French intelligentsia in Indochina. They're being very public about it. They're publishing this. And uh, it was against this backdrop that uh, the uh, editors of La Avenir du Tonkin, uh, his, his, his newspaper editors, decided to send Riquez to Bangkok to cover the King's Jubilee in 1903. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is, this is creates this kind of tension between this, this, uh, what was supposed to be this happy event and coverage of this happy event and this kind of backdrop of this, this, uh, very, very powerful French rhetoric of what they, they consider to be, a, a, a acceptable argument for a land grab. Now the, the King's 50th birthday Jubilee is not a well-known event in the history of modern Thailand. Uh, there are only a few contemporary descriptions of it in the foreign press. And I, I am aware there, there was uh, at least one English language newspaper and I believe one French language, possibly more uh, newspapers publishing at the time in Bangkok. And, and unfortunately I, I could not access those before uh, this, um, this talk. Uh, but I know that in the foreign press, such as the, the Singapore press, uh, that there was mentions of this and they had reporters on the scene, but none of them gave the kind of long detailed commentary that Riquez did, uh, which adds a lot of value to his descriptions uh, because there's some of the few descriptions we have of this event uh, outside of Thailand. Uh, and unfortunately, I could find no photographs of this event. Uh, and I, I was hoping to travel to uh, Bangkok prior to giving this, this, uh, this address uh, 
and and go to archives and, and maybe hopefully find a picture or two to include. Uh, but because of the COVID pandemic and uh, Singapore's uh, very restrictive uh, travel uh, requirements, uh, quarantine, et cetera, et cetera, uh, here I am in Singapore instead. So you're going to have to make do with with what I was able to put together. Uh, but I think you know, I, I, as a polemicist, Riquez was 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 instructed to a kind of attack Siam. Uh, and you know promote French colonial interests, but as a kind of born traveler, as this explorer without a mission, he can't he couldn't help but sort of love the the exotic splendor of the place. Uh, and I think the tensions between these two modes really energizes the descriptions that he puts together. Uh, and as a kind of a light motif throughout the text uh, of of his descriptions, we find these close encounters with the presiding spirit of the event, with the king himself. They kind of build up to a final moment. Um, now, Riquez covered the uh, event in three parts for L'Avenir du Tonkin in this kind of chatty journalistic style of his travel books. And these pieces were condensed for publication uh, in Revue Indo Chinois uh, that features a more kind of polemical tone. Uh, so that there's two separate kind of versions of his descriptions that, that are available to us today uh, that both appeared in, uh, within, within a few months of each other uh, in the, the press in Indochina. Uh, and that sort of shows you that, that this was not considered a kind of small event on behalf of the, the French press. That this was something they were keeping their eye on. Uh, they were very much, very much curious about what's happening in Bangkok, what's the tone of things happening in Bangkok. So because his coverage of this was considered important for them. Now, the 50th birthday jubilee in 1903 was originally scheduled for September, but was postponed until November due to heavy rains. And uh, this meant that official events for the jubilee would coincide with the king's public duties, such as the uh, Loi Krathong festival. Uh, so these things became kind of merged. Uh, on the first day of the jubilee, there was a children's carnival that was held at the Sanam Luang field, which is beside the Grand Palace uh, in Bangkok. You can see it there. Uh, I think if you've ever been to Bangkok, you, you know this, this big space that's beside the Grand Palace. You can see the Grand Palace on the horizon. And if you can imagine that field then filled with children uh, from all over the kingdom. And the idea was they would bring together all ethnicities, children from all over the kingdom to come to this one place. Uh, and they each were given a medal. Each child was given a silver medal suspended on a silver chain. And Riquez describes the, uh, the king wandering through this kind of field filled with children, handing out medals. And uh, he had a few assistants with him who also handed out baskets filled with toys and food. Uh, and this was a, you know, the, the opening event of, of the Jubilee was this uh, reaching out to the children of his people. Later that day, Riquez watched as Chula Longkorn uh, perform the traditional Loi Krithong rituals with the king washing away the sins of his people by bathing in the Chow Phraya River. And Riquez could not help but wryly note that bathing is only an expression because seldom have we seen water more black, more foul than that of the river in Bangkok. Uh, so the sort of horrible image of the, of the king descending into this fetid black water uh, doesn't really match the kind of postcard images we have today of, uh, of the Loi Krithong festivals that, that are going on. Now, one of the major uh, events that happened during the Jubilee festivals, uh, which, were, which were centered around uh, Dusit Park, uh, and here's a, uh, an aerial photograph of, of Dusit, um, which was the site of the new uh, royal residences that uh, Chula Longorn had uh, constructed north of the old city. And uh, one of the big events was a banquet that he held uh, that first night for ministers and foreign guests. Uh, so his, his own ministers, which included many European advisors, uh, were there. And then foreign press who were also there. Of course, Riquez was also there. And there was a hall that, in which there was a sumptuous banquet. Everyone, again, was given a commemorative medal. And there was, uh, Riquez is, is sure to point out, there was a long bar serving both French wine and English whiskey uh, as this kind of uh, gesture to, to both sides, both of the European powers on either side of his kingdom, uh, both of whom had, had their own intentions. Uh, for the land grabs, but you know, here we are in, in Dusit handing out French wine and English whiskey. And Riquez's uh, eye was drawn to the, the, de the decorations. And here's the kind of detail, which I mean, which is lacking in the other descriptions I've seen of this event. Uh, he describes in detail, here's an exact uh, quote, translated quote, almost two kilometers of the main avenue leading to the park was illuminated by a succession of bright triumphal arches. 
The park was surrounded by huge trellises garnished with electric lamps. The edges of the canals, ponds, bridges, groves, and flower beds were filled with thousands of electric lamps and thousands of lanterns of all shapes and colors. In the middle of the park, a water buffalo constructed as high as a two-story house raised 15 meters above the ground provided the principal motif of all of these dazzling illuminations. And this is where his, his travel writing is, is, it really comes to the fore, maybe, maybe rises above kind of standard uh, polemical journalism, uh, where he has, he has this very this kind of aesthetic uh, sensational experience that he is able to capture and, and portray for his audience. Uh, and luckily for us, he did this uh, for this event as well. Now, the highlight of this this banquet was not only this, this gorgeous kind of, uh, you know, the lighting that was set around the thing, but there were dance groups from across Asia that were brought uh, to perform on stages that were interspersed uh, throughout these gardens. Uh, and he first describes the Cambodian troupe, who he says with delicate art and a chaste voluptuousness, uh, took the audience through the phases of desire, seduction, jealousy, and abandonment. Uh, while Laotians, supple and undulating, performed a sacred lotus dance. And that seems at first, oh, well, this is a kind of cliche thing. You get these kind of dancers coming for the foreigners, and yeah, the foreigners like this kind of stuff. But you stop and think for a moment that, that these, uh, these dance troops would have had to have been given French permission to go to Bangkok to perform. They're, 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 they're coming from presumably coming from, they were not in Thailand, but if they did come from Laos and Cambodia, they would have been given permission to go there to perform, uh, which, which says something about the kind of tensions that are happening between these two administrations. Um, and that's, that's an odd kind of point in, in and of itself, but it gets a bit stranger because the next dance troupe that's described is actually a uh, Bangsawan, a Malaysian Bangsawan that was performed in what sounds like a really fantastic stage setting uh, he describes it as this way. There's a pond that rise, from a pond rises half the body of a gigantic crocodile. Its horrible, monstrous mouth is wide open. A Malaysian orchestra is busy inside, accompanying the pantoons sung by sweet-faced girls. And these are songs and rhymed couplets, which were part of the Bangsawan uh, uh, repertoire, often improvised. Uh, so we have, we have the Laotians and the Cambodians, and then we have this Malaysian troupe, all performing in Dusit. And there was also a Chinese opera performing uh, in, within this, this same kind of space. Um, and he writes of this, noisier and of dubious sex than the Malays are the Chinese, for the seductive child mincing under the gaze of the old Ru could well be a boy brought up to be a girl. And one, one kind of wonders, you know, the, where, where did they come from, from China itself? Were they brought from Singapore or Malaya? Or maybe they were already resident in Bangkok and one of the Chinese operas that was in Bangkok. Uh, we don't know. Uh, but so now we have yet one more ethnicity. And then finally, there are also Japanese uh, who, who uh, there was a geisha performance. So he says, finally, the, the elegant Japanese geishas with their fan dance and fox hunt pantomime captivate the numerous spectators who are equally bedazzled by the golden diamonds, the beauty of form, the science of mimicry of the most beautiful girls of the kingdom of Siam, selected by the princes to perform in Lacon dances presented to us tonight. So there was this incredible spectacle that was happening uh, in Dusit um, with all of these different uh, performance groups from across Asia. And the kind of pan-Asian identity that's coming across there is something that I think is, is worthy uh, of, of considering. Um, and what, what was being said here? What was the messaging that was happening? And uh, it, my, my just quick takeaway from this was that the king himself uh, was perhaps demonstrating a kind of, um, uh, as the only Asian sovereign who was not being, being uh, in Southeast Asia, being, being uh, under the, the thumb of a, a colonizing European power, perhaps he was kind of exercising a, this uh, uh, a kind of pan-Asian figurehead. Yeah, this, this, uh, that he, he, he could be someone who, who was able to bring, literally bring all of these uh, uh, traditions and ethnicities together at one point. And that's kind of, it's fun and it's, and it's a spectacle, but also sends a, a kind of subtle message uh, about uh, the kind of power he could have as, as an Asian monarch. And uh, Riquez describes him as uh, the king himself, very simply attired, uh, accompanied by two aides, was wandering amongst the groups of spectators in front of the different stages, mingling with his guests, chatting with them, and enjoying everyone's pleasure. So he was, he was putting himself out there as this was going on. 
Then there's a contrast in, in the descriptions. Uh, an, another night, I believe it's the next night, Riquez is walking around the city streets uh, and he says he's drawn, he writes, by the music of a circular metal xylophone and bamboo flutes echoing from a temple near the palace. Voices rose in slow chanting and from uh, the darkness, he spied the king and his entourage praying before the altar of Buddha, protector of his throne. The princes and dignitaries of the kingdom would keep vigil with their master all night. And this is a nice contrast to the, these kind of spectacles that are happening. Here we see Chulalongorn as, as the pious uh, king, uh, the king who knows his place uh, with Buddha above him, uh, his princes and dignitaries around him. And I think when, when uh, the, this kind of cult of Chulalongorn that, that exists in modern Thailand, for example, you can see this uh, uh, amulet that's for sale. Uh, the kind of potency that this this king still has. Uh, I, it, people have, uh, I think think of this kind of piety as opposed to the uh, you know the Bang Sawan and the and the Chinese operas and all this kind of stuff. So it's interesting. Riquez was was included this as as a kind of balance to that. Now, as another part of this uh, jubilee was presenting Bangkok as a modern city and Chulalongorn's uh, modernizing efforts. And uh, the opening, the inauguration of the, and I will do my best to say this correctly, the Makawan Rangsan Bridge, which is still there. I'm, I've been across it, beautiful bridge, Makawan Rangsan Bridge, uh, which linked the new royal residences in Dusit. You can see the palace there at the end of the road. Um, to the older palace complex in the south along uh, the, the main road. This, this bridge was designed by an Italian uh, architect who had been hired by the king. And Riquez describes the moment when his majesty cuts the ribbon uh, that had been, been put there so to literally open the bridge and, and, and welcome the people in. Uh, and uh, he writes this, that the, he uh, appears in his royal car wearing a general's uniform with a peaked cap. He used golden scissors to cut the yellow satin banner and Riquez wrote that the king that morning was the most handsome Siamese person he had ever seen. So one has an image of this kind of regal figure coming forth from the, uh, the royal automobile and uh, stepping forward with a golden scissors to cut the ribbon and, and open up modern Bangkok. And then, and then there it is. Now, clearly the Jubilee was, was intended to highlight Chulalongorn's uh, modernization efforts and to create a kind of pan-Asian appeal to his position uh, as an Asian monarch. Uh, but the modernization came with a price. And this, this is, is some, there's, there's, there was a play written. And unfortunately, the, the tie, he didn't include the title, which was probably in Thai anyway, but he didn't include the title of the play. A play written by uh, the crown prince Wachiwrawut, uh, who had recently returned from a decade of schooling in England and who uh, satirizes the modernization that's happening uh, under his father's impetus uh, in the country. So uh, uh, the Crown Prince had been born in 1881. He would have been 22 at the time. So he's still a young man uh, in 1903. He would later assume the throne in 1910 and would uh, reign as King Rama VI until 1925. Uh, and he's also known for uh, founding uh, Chula Longhorn University in 1917. But what we see in 1903 is a much more kind of, uh, uh, young man's uh, satire of, of the father's efforts. And uh, he produced this play, uh, which in Riquez's description, the main character sports European clothes while mocking locals in traditional dress. He shakes hands in greeting instead of offering the traditional why, even with venerated monks. He complains about the lack of electric fans. He smokes Egyptian cigarettes while lounging before an altar to Buddha, mingling profane exhalations with the devotional smoke of the joss sticks. Um, and I, I believe this was produced, this satirical play may have been produced based on descriptions in obviously Call and Dusit, which still stands, but I'm not sure. Maybe someone who knows a lot more about Bangkok's architectural history could, could look into that. But it seems like this play was produced, this satirical play was produced uh, in this hall. Now, such uh, satire, he, uh, you know, this, this satire was, was, was absolutely sacrilegious. Uh, uh, the, the assembled courtiers uh, were absolutely scandalized by this, this play, but they couldn't show their disapproval because the play was penned by the crown prince and all of the actors in the play were also crown princes. So Riquez took great joy 
he said, in this very audacious, very daring, unvarnished depiction of the tendencies of the younger generation of Siamese. And he really enjoyed the faces of the elders in the audience twisted in strained grimaces because they can't complain about the play. That would be, you know, the, 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 considered an insult, but they're clearly very uncomfortable by what's happening. And so while looking at their, their grimacing faces, Riquez tried to guess what would they be thinking. The play was a horrible scandal. What does the future hold for Siam? Décément les deux vent. The gods are definitely leaving. And there he signs off on, on the piece. Uh, so this, this is especially interesting. And uh, you know, if, if um, the title of this play could be found and, and uh, it, this, this in and of itself could become a kind of academic paper, just looking at this one play that the Crown Prince wrote. As far as I know, Riquez's description is the only one that exists of it uh, outside of Thailand itself. Now, while the local court found the play to be a scandal, uh, the Crown Prince's satire was not lost on the European audience, who were also there, and they found it absolutely fascinating as a commentary on the modernization efforts in, in Siam. And uh, Riquez's description of the performance was excerpted in the bulletin for the French School of the Far East, uh, if in 1903, and there's the cover, and then you can, you can see his name there. They just took the description from uh, published in L'Avenir du Tonkin and uh, reprinted it in the bulletin because they, they felt that it, quote, shed light as informative as and unexpected on certain trends within the Siamese court. Uh, and I, you know, the, the, the suggestion is that perhaps the crown prince would be uh, maybe may more of a friend to French efforts in, in Siam uh, than the king currently is. Uh, so this, this aspect of Riquez's coverage of the event uh, gained a, a wider attention. Uh, and was was given a sort of highlight by the by the school of the Far East. Now the culmination of Riquez's visit was an invitation audience with Chula Longhorn for members of the French legation departing that same day. And unfortunately, the full extent of this description comes to us only as a single sentence in an excerpt of a telegram that Riquez sent to the editors in Hanoi upon his return to Saigon. And then they printed uh, this telegram. Uh, in the L'Avenir de Tonkin. Um, and all that, well, unfortunately, it really is a shame there wasn't more of this. Well, all that Riquez writes is he reports that the king was very friendly, uh, spoke to him about the Hanoi Exposition, which the king says he knew to have been very beautiful. I've, I've put it in the box there. That's the full extent of it. So it, it, this, in the end, what happens is Riquez manages to kind of co-opt Chula Longhorn's eminence for his own French cause uh, uh, of the Hanoi Exhibition. Uh, as well as his own, for Riquez had a hand in promoting that exhibition. And that's a very Riquezian maneuver to kind of find a way to insert himself for something he's been involved with into uh, someone else's success and eminence. So he left Bangkok after this and he would never return. Let's very quickly then wrap up what he did do uh, in the few years that were left to him. He would be dead within uh, a few years and th within three years of this. So. What did he do during that time? Uh, he went on to become the uh, directing editor of uh, Review into uh, Review into Chinois uh, before launching on a year-long expedition across Laos to collect material for an upcoming colonial exposition in Marseille. Uh, which uh, so in 1905 he was he was marching through Laos, uh, and that exhibition was 1906. Interestingly, during that time he took hundreds of photographs. And he also recorded over 300, he says, 300 phonograph cylinders, which are likely the first ever sound recordings that were made in Laos. And here's one, luckily, uh, one of his traveling companions, uh, Des Sessements, uh, uh, took this photo of him. And you can see the, uh, the phonograph set up on the table in front of, of Riquez. Uh, and there's some musicians in a pipat uh, uh, ensemble around him. Uh, and then there's this group of children back there. And, and one can imagine the amount of noise that must have been happening under the blazing sun. And he's trying to get, these things only last about two minutes. The wax on the cylinder would get soft under the sunshine. So he's got to get the recording done fairly quickly. And you can see an arm coming up behind him where I think he's trying to bring order to the, to the unruly children so he can get his recording done. Uh, a really fantastic photograph. So after he, he, had, he had, and these are lost, by the way. Uh, these recordings are, are uh, gone. Uh, hopefully in an archive somewhere. Maybe someday someone will 
send me an email and say they found them. So it, he, he traveled then to Marseille after he had he finished collecting for a whole year in Laos. Uh, and he organized the pavilion. There was one for each of the, uh, the Indo-Chinese colonies as well as all the French colonies uh, in Marseille. And it was a year long exposition. It was quite, quite an event. And he brought with him a troupe of Laotian dancers, three, three girls as well as two boys uh, who became kind of minor celebrities in France at the time. There's a lot of coverage about their, their uh, appearance in Marseille. Uh, and of course, he was then able to, to again, rise, rise on their fame, his name always attached to theirs in, in press coverage. In this postcard, which was published there, he is standing there. Uh, you can see his name on the postcard. Uh, and he may have, in my book, I, I touch on this, and there's not real proof for it, but you can see him kind of, a, I guess, I, could we call it gazing lovingly? Certainly gazing at uh, the uh, Laotian girl who's closest to him. Uh, her name was Sao Si, or at least that's the stage name she used. Uh, and you can see in the way this picture has been arranged, she's kind of between Riquez and between the other Laotians in this kind of funny uh, zone. She's almost in her own box. Uh, and that might be a kind of statement on, on her own proclivities. Uh, I also like the fact they're all wearing European shoes. So there's traditional dress that they're wearing, but then European shoes, because they're, they're going to go walk the streets of Marseille. Um, so. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then uh, in, he dies in January 1907, one month after uh, or two months after the exposition ends. Uh, and it was revealed that his name was not Alfred Riquez. It turns out that this entire time that he had been in the Far East, he had been on the run from the law. His true name was Joseph Gervais. He had been a married lawyer from the northern French city of Lille. And he had run a kind of like pyramid scheme uh, it wound up going very bad for him. Uh, and he was declared bankrupt. There was a arrest warrant issued for him, but he had, he had slipped away, some say to London. And nobody really knew what happened to him, except that he stole the cash box. Remember, he said his name rhymes with the word Lacaz. And that's because he stole the cash box from the church on his way out of town. And as we now know, he shows up in Indochina a few months later with this fake name, uh, an armful of money, and, and plans to become a writer, which he did. Now, what happened was, after this information came out, uh, there was a kind of a minor scandal, of course, and uh, he had embarrassed so many people in so many positions of power that he was basically buried. I mean, he was physically buried in, in Marseille, but he, his, his his, uh, his reputation, uh, his work uh, was, was almost completely forgotten. And if it hadn't been for postcard collectors, uh, sort of early photography aficionados, and especially stamp collectors who were buying the postcards because they have the, the old stamps on them, he would have been almost completely forgotten, uh, kind of this anomaly. So it's only recently um, that his work is, has come to light. Uh, and this kind of incredible story as well as all the, the, the detail he captures of life, I'm mean, given from, the, from a French colonial perspective, but he still, he captures an incredible amount of detail of life uh, in Southeast Asia uh, at the Fond du Seclus. And for that, I think he's, you know, he's worth your time. Uh, so once again, plugs, shameless plugs. Here's the three books I've done on Riquez. Uh, two of the translations with my very good friend, Paul Bruthia. Hello, Paul. Paul lives in Chiang Mai. He's a lot closer to you than I am. Uh, those are available from the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies Press. And then my book, the um, biography of Riquez, uh, which was published uh, by Rutledge this year. Uh, all of these are available online. Now, if you, uh, and, or in your fine local bookstore. If you don't want to spend money, I totally understand. I don't like spending money either. Paul and I last year uh, put together what we call the Mission Riquez blog project. And, and it's a translation and annotation of Riquez's published travel journal through Laos in 1905. Uh, and it's, I think it's a good, a good way to introduce yourself to him, his writing, uh, as well as our uh, uh, kind of scholarly work on him. And of course it's, you know, it's free and you can do it on your phone. Uh, really it's a, it's a win-win uh, for everyone. Uh, so there it is. It's a WordPress blog. You can you can follow that link, uh, or you can just Google Mission Riquez, uh, and and you should be able to find that fairly quickly. It's a good read. 
So allow me to finish up by saying merci, thank you, and crap and crap. Uh, I guess it's time for Q&A. So uh, Nicholas, you want to take over? Yes, certainly. Thank you very much. Uh, merci, William. Uh, okay, I was going to say, uh, I'm not exactly sure people know how to post a question in a Q&A box, but uh, suddenly I received one question here. And I myself will have a few. Uh, Great. Should we have time? So why don't I start with a question posted by Valérie Suwanseri. I read out. What is the durability of the bamboo paper manufactured in Vietnam compared to European and American paper products of the time? I don't know if you can, you're able to answer to this. Well then, I have to confess, I'm no expert on paper manufacturing uh, of the time. What I did discover in my research on uh, F.H. Schneider, who is another figure who is very understudied, um, he, the amount of power he had and the uh, influence he had in Indochina and then back in, in, in the homeland in the metropole through the party colonial uh, because of his printing empire uh, was profound. And he and his brother's names pop up uh, in very high places. And the reason that was given, the only thing I could find in the research that the, the, it, it, the kind of reason he was able to gain this monopoly in the first place was because he had been able to find a cheap way to print paper, produce paper in Indochina itself, as opposed to bringing paper in from uh, Europe or you know, yeah, having to import it. And the, the, uh, the, the, I guess the cheapest way to make paper in Indochina at the time, perhaps still, uh, was bamboo. Uh, so that's, that's my only answer to that question. I don't, I don't know how the quality compares. I've handled a lot of that stuff. You know, it's a hundred years old now. And I've handled a lot of that original documents that were printed on paper produced by F.H. Schneider. And uh, I can tell you it disintegrates. It's just very brittle. Uh, and it doesn't take much when you turn the page of one of these giant thousand page volumes that they produced. Uh, you turn a page and it, it's crackling in your hand. Uh, so I, I, I don't know how that would compare to European or North American standards at the time. Thank you. I hope uh, this uh, answer satisfies Valérie. Are there any more questions or comments? You can post them on the chat box or Q&A. And while waiting, I may, uh, William, uh, perhaps go with my own uh, uh, question. Sure. Um, could you give us more details on the Jubilee? Like how long did it last? When exactly what the dates, you know? Um, you said um, Alfred Raquez had finally he met the king. I, I yeah. actually don't call him. They, he had an audience. So how did it go? You know, the uh, jubilee itself went on for twelve days. in French, in English. Right. I mean, you know, I, I would assume there? he had some kind of a translator with him. Uh, he didn't speak Thai himself. Uh, the jubilee went on for twelve days, but he left before it was over. And uh, from what I was able to find, and and when he leaves, our our record of it, at least the one I looked at in detail kind of ends. Uh, but I do know it went on for another 12 days. And there was uh, other uh, events, horse races and these kind of events where the, where the king was present. I get the impression that the first few days uh, were really engineered for the foreign press and the local press. It, you know, it was here It was here that he did things like uh, uh, the, the, where the king cut the ribbon on the bridge. They had the big banquet and all the performances. Uh, and the sense that uh, once these were completed, it was the, the foreign press could leave and they wouldn't miss out on much except for the horse races and things like this. Uh, I believe it started on the 1st of November and then ran for the next 12 days. It would be good to get in there and see uh, original copies of um, the Bangkok English language newspapers so I could read them. Uh, and I'm sure there was much more extensive coverage there uh, than in the, the, uh, the, the other colonial press in, in Southeast Asia, which is what I was looking at. Uh, but unfortunately, those aren't available online, and uh, I couldn't go to Thailand. That's not, I'm not in Thailand. That's, that's not no, Bangkok back there. Yes. No, that's not really Bangkok. <laughs> okay. And uh, during those 12 days, you said there's been some uh, shows, uh, dancing, uh, et cetera. Uh, were there like some kind of pavillon for uh, the Lao troops and the uh, the, the Chinese opera, I mean, I mean, with this 
shows you know repeated over uh, the days uh, mm. can we compare this jubilee to a kind of uh, i don't know uh, to an exhibition right uh, i won't say right. uh, an universe uh, exposition universal but some kind of pan asian exhibition yes. that we you know counter uh, these uh, events happening in France. And Based on the description he provides, it's impossible to say. Uh, I would have to find some other, other descriptions of the event. Uh, the, he's describing those dance troops in, in one night in, in Doucet Park. Uh, so there was this massive party set up basically. And he describes the lights hanging from the trees and you know, I read this description. And these stages were set up uh, throughout the park. Um, and you could, my, my impression from what he's describing is you could kind of wander through the park and, and then linger in front of these different stages that were set up. Uh, in addition to having a banqueting hall uh, for the, 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 the royal uh, you know, court, uh, the ministers and the foreign press. And then uh, outside of that banquet hall was this kind of illuminated garden space with all of these performances. Whether that happened continually or if it was a one-time event, I don't know. He only describes it happening on that one night. Uh, but if, if it was this kind of expo style that you're describing, it would be, it would be good to know that. And you mentioned the Hanoi exhibition, uh, which yes. happened just, just before. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, this was in 1902, and it was the first colonial exhibition set up in the colonies yes. itself, which, was, which is one of the reasons it's, it's kind of a, a hallmark. It was a complete disaster uh, financially. It ruined the Hanoi city budget for, for years. Uh, one, one book says it took a decade for them to, to make back the money they lost in putting this together. But it was a, a way to highlight uh, French uh, colonial efforts in, uh, in Asia. And uh, it was, a, a, like you were describing, like the Exposition Universal, it was uh, different areas set up where there were um, pavilions for different countries. So there, there would be a pavilion for Laos, pavilion for Cambodia. Uh, and then other regional uh, colonies uh, also had... Um, Pavilions. There was one for the Philippines, uh, and then other countries, so, including one for Siam. So sovereign countries also sent one. And the British Malaya had a pavilion, and it was much more what we think of, like the Marseille exhibition. It was much more of a kind of idea of wandering around for. Uh, you could spend several days consecutively and, and see something different on every single day. Much more like the Expo, which which still happens. I, I guess it still happens every year. Um, you know, the Expos, the, the World Expos that, that happen. And that's what, that's what the Hanoi exhibition was. And Riquez's role in that was largely as a publicist. He, he wrote articles, he wrote a book about it. Uh, he escorted the foreign press who would come in to cover it. Uh, and and he, was, he was really kind of a, a publicist for that event. And, and did the King, King Sholongkorn attend it to that? That's not what it, it says. I and mean, it's odd that, you know, that he meets, we have that one sentence description. Right. And it's funny for a guy who wrote all of, all of his volumes and volumes, he didn't mm. have more to say about this, but he mm. also doesn't have much to say when he meets Auguste Rodin like two years later. So, mm. uh, but what, I, my impression is if, if, if it doesn't contribute to his own uh, ability to, to, to kind of uh, uh, create his own eminence, he, he doesn't bother mentioning it. So with Chula Longcorn, who knows how long they had to speak. He was there with the whole French legation who had visited Bangkok with about six other people. Mm -hmm. uh, and they traveled via Singapore by a boat, and they were they were going to leave that day. They were given this audience. They went in, presumably uh, in some kind of audience hall in Dusit, and uh, met the king, uh, probably fairly quickly. I, I would imagine it's much like an event today. If you've ever met a president or something, you know you're kept at a distance. You get about thirty seconds to to have an interaction, and then you're shuffled out for the next the next group to come in and, and the, for the same thing. And I, that's the impression I have. It, and the one thing that, that Riquez reports is Chula Longcorn knew of and liked the Hanoi ex exhibition, uh, which of course Riquez had his own interest in. So that's what he turns around and reports back in his telegram to Hanoi. Okay, uh, perhaps very quickly, and then I turn to a couple of other questions just came in. Uh, you show a few postcards and photographs. Are these hmm. from Raquez himself or? Uh, some, have, some of them were, yes. The ones- uh, documentation of Raquez in, in, during his travel in Bangkok? No, there's nothing. Because there's, there's, but... there's only his written descriptions of it. Okay. Uh, and I, I did look online uh, fairly deeply for, for at least a photograph of the event, maybe of the king you know, cutting the ribbon on the bridge or something. I could find nothing. I'm sure that there are photographs or at one point were in archives in Thailand. Uh, and it would take it would take a, a, an effort to find them, but it's it's worth it. Um, 
and you, you might have to be um, you know fluent in Thai. I don't, I can't read it or speak it. So I, I, I would, I would run into difficulties immediately searching in the archives in, in Thailand. But if this sparks anyone's interest who, uh, uh, you know, who wants to do that, please reach out to me. I'll share with you the information I have beyond this lecture. And uh, if you can, if you can search in the archives in Thailand, that maybe there's a, a wealth of information about this event. I mean, he, the king was giving out all these medallions. There must be someone must have a few still, you know what I mean? Um, but I never found one for sale on eBay or anything like this. I, it's, the usual places all, all were empty. Okay, uh, one question by uh, Yung Jen Tan. I read it out. Ironically, French took the last piece of Siamese land of Laos after two years of the Golden Jubilee and Cambodia in 907. So yes. I am wondering what's the feeling of a or expression of the Siamese royals and nobles when they're confronting such person from the French colony? I mean, there's, there's a lot of literature written on um, the kind of predicament that Siam found itself in uh, being sandwiched between the English in Burma and the French in, in Indochina. Uh, and, and the way that Chula Longhorn very, very cautiously and carefully manipulated these two powers regionally, um, while also bringing in European advisors uh, and uh, to not just advise on administration, but to actually advise on the modernization of Bangkok, you know, the, the, the buildings and, and the design of the bridges and things like this. Um, the French continued to nibble away as much as they could. And I think, yeah, 1907 sounds about right as the last date that they got a, a chunk of land. And that continues to this day. If you look at a map of the, the modern borders uh, between Thailand and, and Laos and Cambodia, that, that's where the borders were determined by the French in these kind of land grabs. Uh, the 1907, I believe it was because the kingdom of, the kingdom of Champensak, which is in Southern Laos, uh, the king there had some kind of affiliation. I can't remember exactly. You can, you can find this fairly, fairly easy though. Has some kind of affiliation where uh, he kind of switched sides and decided that he wanted a French protection. And once that happened, uh, the French said, look, this is our land. And the king of Champensac's land traditionally cuts into what was Siam. Uh, and you know, you have a choice. You, you can give us this land or, or we can cause problems for you. And it was a small piece of land. And I, I you know, the, the Siam kind of you know, fine, fine have it. Um, I mean, keep in mind the gun, gunboat diplomacy, the Pac Man incident in, a, I believe it was 1893. I mean, there were gunboats sailed up the Chow Phraya. I mean, and the, that 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 memory of that event didn't just go away by 1907. I, and I, you know, that there was always, and, and in all of these situations, and let's, let's just be straight up about it, and the colonization happens at the end of a gun. And, you know, eventually the guns go away and the wine comes out and people learn poetry and all of that. But if the poetry and the wine fails, the guns come back very quickly. Uh, you know, and this, we can't romanticize colonialism in that regard. I, I think I, I, that might be a good thing to say towards the end of this, you know, that we're not, we're not trying to say this was some sort of happy event for the people of Southeast Asia. Uh, however, it, it, it happened and, and something that we need to, as historians, we need to be able to account for these kinds of things. Thank you, William. And perhaps one last uh, question uh, by Valerie Swansey again. Not sure if I missed it, but what was the cause of Vasquez death? death? Was it disease? Ooh. Any speculations? Ooh, maybe you should just buy my book. Maybe, maybe, maybe the best thing to do is just give me $4 and buy my book. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this, though, to tantalize you. Uh, it was reported that he died of uh, pox, a very fast moving kind of pox, which, which killed him within uh, um, 24 hours. But after the truth came out, there were all these, these rumors that perhaps he committed suicide because somebody from his past had, had I mean, he, there he was in France, publishing his photograph in the newspapers, when only less than 10 years previously, he, he had you know, skipped town on his wife and his kids and stolen money and left all of these people in the lurch during this giant pyramid scheme that went wrong. So there were people who probably were after him, or at least not very happy to see his face in the paper. And it could be somebody showed up one night in Marseille and said, look, Joseph, you know, you, 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 you got to pay the fiddler or we're going to expose you or something like that. And he poisoned himself. That was said at the time, and it's not implausible by any means. Uh, the other one that, that, that is a bit uh, uh, kind of uh, tantalizing is that it's possible he was poisoned by his uh, mistress. 
because there's a letter published after he died that that mentions a woman only that we only know is Valentine, which is a great name for a mistress, if you ask me. But who was Valentine? Uh, it seems like she was probably Indo-Chinese. It may have been one of the Laotians he brought with him to as uh, you know one of the dance performers. Uh, I cover that in some detail in my book. Um, everyone who gets into this story has their own kind of theory about this. It's kind of like the Kennedy assassination, only you know much much smaller. Uh, but everyone has their own theory, and uh, in my book, I put forward just the kind of facts that I've been able to find, and and you can you can choose your own adventure and decide uh, you know what what finally did him in. So uh, yeah, Marseille was already the French uh, the site of the French connection, wasn't it? Yeah, that's that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Okay, uh, I see no more questions right here. So I think it's a good time to uh, put an end to this uh, talk and conversation with Dr. William uh, Gibson. We thank you very much, William. Thank you, thank you, Nicholas. For this uh, excellent uh, uh, presentation and teasing. Uh, so <laughs> again, uh, if you'd like to learn more, as I certainly would like to learn more about Alfred Raquez, I didn't know about his existence even before. Uh, yeah, please go to the various sources uh, William has given us, including the book and other uh, translations and all, all these resources, some are available online. So uh, thank you for that. And uh, before we close, I'd like to give to the audience uh, some uh, closing notes. Uh, thank you again for attending the Science Society talk. You are, of course, always Welcome to subscribe and follow the various activities and talks on the society channels on Facebook and YouTube for the future program. Speaking of uh, next program, we'll, Siam Society will have a special talk and a panel discussion on Kuang Luang Yang Keo development project. I believe this will be conducted in Thai. Uh, and this will be on Saturday, 27 of November in the afternoon at 1.30. And then um, on December 2nd, Thursday, back to your talk on Zoom at 4 p.m., a lecture titled A Tone, with, a Tone Without a Cinema, Past, Pandemic, Present, and Future of the Luang Pabang Film Festival by Shan Shadwell. And finally, in about a month on 16 December, at 4 p.m. Bank of Time, a lecture exploring the textile traditions of Alo Regency in Indonesia by Linda McIntosh. So that's about the future program of the society. And um, I thank you very much. So attendees may now leave the space and I will like to thanks once again, uh, William Gibson for his time. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Nicholas. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Bye-bye. <laughs>